Father, we come to you just once again to worship you on this midweek service. We thank you, Lord, for the rest you gave us last night, and for the air we get to breathe this morning, and we just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to just be able to worship you. We thank you, Lord, that we have your preserved word in the King James Bible. We thank you, Lord, that for the many things that you do in our lives each and every day that we just take for granted or we're just not even aware of. Father, we just pray that you'll bless this service. Be with your servant. Give me the words that need to be spoken and the hearts and minds and ears open to hear the word. And just pray that you'll bless those that are here and listening online. Just uh, give us a blessed day. We just continue to pray for this nation that our leaders will start doing things that are wise that are according to your word and not trying to implement the new world order and some of the other things that the, the path that they're taking and we pray that they might be convicted and that they might get saved we might have a great revival to hit this nation and to spread around the world and father we just ask all these things in jesus name amen we're going to be continuing our study on zachariah this will be zachariah part 20. Now, we're going to be picking up in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 8, but just uh, one minute or so on what we were looking at last week, so we can kind of have some clue of what verse 8 is going to be talking about. You know, in verse 4 of last week, we were talking about how old men and old women would dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and then we saw in verse 5 how boys and girls would be playing in the streets all around, and, you know, and I mentioned how... You know, they're actually, they were talking about like young, young um, boys and girls here, you know, that under like 12 years old. And so you're going to see all these extremes. And I said how everybody was going to live to be real old. And all this was referring to during the millennium when people are going to be living, you know, like they did before the flood, you know, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And then we saw in, in verse 7 that the Lord of hosts said that, behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country. And so I said, that, you know, he's going to be bringing in people, saving them from all over. That that we we know that the, at the end of the, tri the great tribulation, that you know, one third of the people all got saved. And so, you know, they all going to return to, to Israel, you know, for the you know the, the start of the, the millennium. So we pick it up in verse eight. So Zechariah chapter eight, verse eight, and I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth, and in righteousness. Now, in this verse, we see that God himself will bring the Israelites to Jerusalem. You know, so this is not going to be, you know, these people, you know, these people are not necessarily coming on their own. You know, it's like anything. You know, God is the one that, that brings people to him. You know, it, it tells in there that, you know, God loved us first. You know, we did not love him. He loved us first. You know, he brings us to him. And it's the same thing. He's bringing the people in. You know, most people think that, Oh well, you know, talk to people that are not not don't do not know the Bible or someone who's not believing in God, and they'll always say that, oh well, these things they just happen on their own. All this. No, God's behind all this stuff. You know, God Himself is bringing these people in, just like with the animals on on Noah's Ark. It said that God brought those. You know, people are always like, well, how did Noah get all these animals? He didn't get all those animals. God said He brought all those animals to Noah. So. All Noah had to do was stand here, and God brought all the animals to him. You know, so it's not like he had to go out and look for. I need two of this animal and two of that animal. It's the same thing here. God's going to bring the Jewish people to Jerusalem. You know, and we see that on a small scale already going on today. Not so much for Jerusalem, but at least Israel as a whole. Now, in this verse, we, as I said, we see God Himself will bring the Israelites to Jerusalem. The fact that God will be the one doing this shows that it is guaranteed to happen. You know. When God's in something, it's definitely going to happen. You know, man says, oh, I'm going to do this. You know, how many times you have politicians say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. You know, they run for president or whatever position. And 99% of the things they never actually do. You know, but when God does, says he's going to do something, it will happen. But God says they will be his people and he will be their God. You know, as God, he will be truth and righteousness. But we see that, you know, there's... there's um, places that there's times when when God basically you know with, when the Israelites had turned away from him and were worshiping all these false gods and that and he basically was like you know I'm turning you over to them that you know you're not my people 
you know, he, now here he is, he's back, you know, calling them, because remember, they were God's chosen people, so he's back to calling them, you know, they will be my people, and, and I will be their God, you know, he's going to be proud to be their God, where, you know, there has been times in the past that, that uh, you know, they're, what they're, the, things, the sins they were living in, that, that, you know, he wanted to destroy them. But as God, I, like I said, he will be truth and righteousness. God will finally, once again, as I said, call them his people and be their God. You know, what I said a while ago, there have been times when God said they were so sinful that he was not their God as they committed adultery with false gods. And he cast Israel out of his sight in, in 1 Kings chapter 17. But God will never again be ashamed to call Israel my people and to say he is their God. You know, you can read 1 Kings 7 chapter 17 or or, um, you know, other places where he finally just, you know, enough's enough. That, you know, that's why he allowed them to be uh, taken in captivity, the, the uh, Judah and then the nation of Israel. You know, the Syrians spread them out and so forth because they they want to live in their, you know, they were, I mean, it, it, there's places in there where it talks about when the, the Jewish people had become more sinful than the heathen around them, the nations that God had destroyed and kicked out of Israel to give them that land. And they were getting, they were becoming worse than them. You know, and it's kind of like us here in the United States of America that, you know, we were founded on Christian principles and stuff. We're not necessarily in the sense like Jews where, you know, the nation of Israel was directly founded by God, but God definitely had an influence on this the founding of this nation. If anybody is that blind and ignorant, cannot see that, then obviously you need to, you either not saved or you need to get right with the Lord. But the, uh, those days are long gone, you know, that, that we have done just like Israel did. We threw everything away and so forth like that. And, you know, we're turning away from God and so forth. So, you know, that's why God's turning away from us because he's not going to bless something that, uh, you know, if we're not being obedient to him. And so we're doing, the, you know, we're doing this time the same thing. We're exporting all of our stuff that, you know, here we are, we were a blessed nation. But in a lot of ways, you know, all these nations that we consider to be, all these heathen nations over in Africa or these places like that. In a lot of ways, the United States of America is far worse than any of these other nations. You know, we always talk about how we got Sodom and Gomorrah right here in, in our nation. And it's so true that, that, you know, we were just like Israel. We became worse than the people that we were supposed to always condemn. We were always talking about how Russia and all them, all their evil, their communism. And what do you think we're bringing here to the United States now and, and doing all this stuff and all these things? You know, we're, we're no better than them, that's for sure. Well, let's look at uh, verse 9. So Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 9. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Let your hands be strong, ye that hear in these days these words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. Now this verse says, Let your hands be strong, which was God encouraging the people to complete the temple as he was with them. So they had no need to fear. You know, God was with the people, so there was no longer a need to fear. So let's get, get to work. You know, stop fearing and just let's do the work I told you. Let's get this temple completed. But the prophets mentioned in this verse are most likely Haggai and Zechariah as they were there at the foundation of the laying of the temple. You know, we've studied about Haggai, and we've been studying through Zechariah, and, you know, we know that, you know, the, the, the ministries of the two were separated by, uh, I believe it was four months, it was either two months or four months, I can't remember now, but, you know, it wasn't that much time period, but they were basically there from the very beginning, you know, they had come with the initial group of people back from uh, there in Babylon, you know, when, when um, Oh, the Persian king uh, starts a C there, whatever its name was. And anyway, when it, they, they were given that permission to return, then, you know, they were some of these original ones. But remember, there's we, we saw in one of the verses a few weeks ago about talking about other prophets, that there are, you know, at least other prophets that at, at the point when those guys were coming and asking about the, you know, the, you know a couple years after Zechariah started ministry, you know, and they came and they were asking all those questions about, do we still have to worship these feasts and this and that? And it talked about other prophets. So at this point, in the, there were some other prophets. But like I said, some of those, they were not initially mentioned by name and Bible and so forth. But more than likely, those ones were not there initially 
at the foundation. So more than likely, what's being talked about here is Haggai and Zechariah. At the very least, it's definitely those two, you know, and then whether it's any other ones or not. But you know, so we know we know they, they were warned and you know about these things. So look at uh, verse 10. So Zechariah chapter 8, verse 10. For before these days there was no hire for man, nor any hire for beast. Neither was there any peace to him that went out or came in because of the affliction. For I set all men, every one, against his neighbor. Now this first shows why the Jews had not built a temple upon their return after laying the foundation. <clears throat> the people came to Judah poor, having been in captivity for 70 years, so they had no money to hire people or beasts. Now Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 8 shows how Nehemiah got the Persian king to give him timber for rebuilding the gates around Jerusalem, which shows they did not have a lot of money. If you would, just uh, hold your finger here and turn to Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 8. So Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 8. Now remember, Nehemiah came after Ezra, you know, so that you know, he wasn't so much building the temple. They were doing that on the, under Ezra. And I can't remember, there was quite a few years in between, but, that you know, he was there more to like build the gates and some of the security of the city and so forth. But it's still the same principle that, you know, they, they were asking for money. So look at Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 8. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gate of the palace, which appertain to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. You know, so he was asking for money, you know, for these beams, for the gates of the palace, and, and what for the house and so forth, wall of the city. Now, the second reason the Jews stopped working on the temple was because they were afflicted by their neighbors, most of whom were in the land when they returned. Now, these strangers were mostly people transplanted there by Nebuchadnezzar. You know, remember when when Nebuchadnezzar took away. Just like Assyria, you know, that was common practice when they took away people. A lot of times they would bring in other people they had conquered, you know, because it's one of those things, if you get spread out and you're not really in your homeland and, you know, whatever, it makes it more difficult to, number one, the people to, to uh, group together to then rebel against you to try to, you know, regain their freedom. But it also was one of those things that's like, well, what difference does it make? Because, you know, whether I get out of here, if I'm not in my homeland and not, you know, not, they, they was not their homeland. So, the, you know, in one sense, it didn't really matter whether they were there, Babylon or whatever, that, you know, they were not where they belonged. But, you know, most of these were strangers. Now, remember, there were some Israelites that were left behind. But then again, they, you know, they probably intermarried with some of these strangers and so forth. But now some of these are mentioned in Ezra and Nehemiah, such as Sanballat and Tobiah. You know, you could read those books or whatever, but. The people also had the king against them and other politicians. But Zechariah says that God says none of these things are excuses as they should have trusted in God to be able to find the resources to build a temple and for God to be able to protect those doing the work as well as the temple itself. Now, this is why God had said in verse 9 to have their hands be strong as he wanted them to trust God to allow them to complete the work on the temple as he would be with them. You know, so... You know, God was saying, you know, that you guys shouldn't have just trust me. You know, that was the problem with, remember when they left Egypt, then Moses had sent out those 12 spies to check out the land. And 10 of them came back, oh, there's all these giants and there's all this and that. And they had all these excuses. You know, like Joshua and Caleb said, no, we can go in there. And yes, there are these giants, this and that, but, you know, God will provide for us. We got this great land, this and that. You know, I trust God. You know, he said he would. Get us, he got us through here across the Red Sea, did all these miracles, gave us water from a rock and all these kind of things, manna and all this stuff. Why can't we not trust him now? You know, it's the same thing here. They should have done like, like Joshua and Caleb and just trusted, but they, instead they were being like those other 10 spies that even after seeing all the miracles that God had already done to get them to that point, <clears throat> they were not trusting God. You know, all the 10 plagues they'd done in Egypt and so forth. And, you know, so these people, it's like, yes, they did not initially have any money. And, yes, they seemed like everything was against them, the politicians, the people in the land, and all this and that. 
But they, they should have just prayed and, and trusted God to say, look, Lord, it's in your hands. If you want us to rebuild this, you're going to have to supply us with, with the materials. And, you know, you're going to have to keep these people off our backs or whatever. That You know, that it, it's in your hands. We cannot do this without you. But they were not doing that. And that's why they delayed for, you know, 14 years or whatever it was. <clears throat> all right. So let's look at, uh, you know, the thing is, that should be a lesson to all of us. You know, we, we're too quick to always try to do everything on our own. And, and, and we need to learn that to trust God for these things instead of, uh, you know, relying on always, oh, we cannot do this because of, the, and then have all these list of excuses. <clears throat> you know, if God tells you to do something, he will make sure you, you have the resources and, and so forth that what you need, you know, so they should just trust in him. Let's look at verse 11. So Zechariah chapter eight, verse 11. But now I will not be under the residue of his people as in the former days, saith the Lord of hosts. So God says that he will not be under the residue of the people as in the former days. Now this means that because of the people's obedience, then God was going to start blessing the nation rather than bring punishment as he had, as had been seen in Babylon in their early struggles in building the temple. You know, so now that the people were finally opening up and, and repenting and turning back to God and doing what they're supposed to be doing and starting to trust him. then God said, look, I'm not going to be punishing you like I did with your 70 years in Babylon or for, uh, you know, these 14 years that you basically were not doing what you're supposed to be doing. <clears throat> it's good. Then, you know, instead you're going to start seeing some blessings. We're going to get this temple done. So let's get to work. You know, let's, let's do the work that I've told you. So look at Zechariah chapter 8, verse 12. For the seed shall be prosperous, the vine shall give her fruit, and the ground shall give her increase, and the heavens shall give their due. And I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these things. So God said that the seed will be prosperous, and the vine will give her fruit, and the ground shall give it her increase, and the heavens their due. What God was saying was that the land of Judah would begin to be blessed <clears throat> and therefore prosper as the land would get the much needed moisture it needed in the desert climate and the crops would bloom and the vine would bring forth grapes. So, you know, again, if they were, if they were just trusting the Lord, which they were starting to do, then God says, I'll start bringing all these things. You know, you're going to have that dew that you need to, you know, have that moisture for the crops to grow. And we're going to, you're going to have, uh, you know, you're going to be blessed and you'll prosper. You know, they, their land was always this desert area, you know, out there in the wilderness. But yet God says he'll, he'll bless them. You know, they're going to have an increase. You know, we, we've seen that. I said it before, like even here in modern times where they have this increase in fruit where they go and they export all the, a lot of this fruit to uh, Europe. You know, Europe gets most of their fruit and stuff from Israel. But yet all of Israel's neighbors or out there dry as a bone in the desert. So, you know, we see some of this stuff. But um, Now, the increase shows they would be blessed with great harvest, you know. So they're going to be, you know, the, the crop, the fruits will be blowing the crops, and then the vines will bring forth the grapes and so forth. So they're going to have these great harvests. But God would allow these things to be done in peace, and he would allow the people to possess these great harvests rather than some foreign power stealing them from them. You know, before they would plant these things, and then oftentimes in somebody else, they, something would happen to them, so then they never got to reap the benefits from them or whatever. And I, and I said this while ago, but I said this blessing continues today as Israel produces much fruit and flowers to export as she has an abundance of crop. But the full blessing of his promise will be fulfilled during the millennium. So, you know, God, ha once again, he, a lot of times he has things, I've said it before, dual meanings or partial meanings or help partial fulfillments. You know, where he's partially fulfilled some of this, where they are seeing this blessing. You know, compared to all their neighbors and, 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 and even a lot of other nations, you know, Israel is producing a lot of these great things. But the full benefit of this and the full peace and all that stuff would not happen until during the millennium. Well, let's look at uh, Zechariah chapter 8, verse 13. And it shall come to pass that as ye were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you, and ye shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. 
God says that the people, both Judah and Israel, had been a curse among the heathen, but that God would save them and they would become a blessing rather than a curse. You know, God, God talked about that in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and so forth, that he had all these lists of things. If they, they obeyed God, they did all these things, they'd have all these lists of blessings. But if they did not, they had this whole big long list of curses that they were going to get, including the curses of the plagues of Israel, uh, Egypt and so forth. And, you know, unfortunately, they ended up getting a lot of those curses because they were not obedient <laughs> to God. But, you know, now he says that, that, um, you know, they had, you know, Judah and Israel had, you know, been a curse among the heathen. You know, so he's showing you that, again, the two houses, you know, remember that Israel was divided up into the two nations of Israel, the ten northern tribes, and Judah, the, the two southern tribes. And he's saying that both nations, that's why, as I said, you know, he had Israel, uh, Israel get spread out by the Syrians, and then Judah, you know, got spread out, you know, to Babylon and so forth. You know, we always, everybody talks about those ten lost tribes, but, you know, I've told about that in James and other places. They're not lost. You know, we may not understand where they're all at, but God knows where they're all at. And we're going to see that in our Revelation study that, you know, God will call 12,000 from each tribe. He knows where they're at. You know, the people themselves as today do not necessarily know what tribe they're even from. If you go and you ask a Jew, well, hey, what tribe are you descended from? They do not know, but God knows. So, you know, that's, that's the only thing that matters. But, you know, we, we see that, you know, both nations had become a curse among the heathen. You know, they were supposed to be out there witnessing for the Lord, but they had become a curse. Like I said, they were worse than the heathen nations they were supposed to be preaching to. But now, you know, God is going to save them all at the end of the Great Tribulation, and they will become a blessing rather than a curse. You know, when, when the people obey God, then they are a blessing to the world as they shine forth God. But when they disobey God, then they are a curse to the world as they turn people away from God. You know, this is not only applied to the nation of Israel, but that, that's even to us as Christians. That, but yet, like I said, Israel was meant to be a nation of priests to the, the Gentiles. You know, and they were not being obedient to God. You know, so they here they became a curse rather than a blessing. They were supposed to be a blessing going out and telling the people about Jesus. But yet, they were disobedient to God, so they became a curse. Because as I said, they became more wicked even than than the uh, the heathen. And it's the same with Christians. You know, too many Christians today, then, like I said, they're trying to still live in the world and be of the world. And so, you know, they're becoming a curse to the heathen because the heathen, they're like, well, why should I become a Christian? This, this person is no worse. I mean, in fact, he's worse than I am. I mean, I've said it before. I blame the church for most of the problems in the world because Christians have never stood up. And the Christians, as I said, a lot of them are just like Israel. They're becoming worse than the heathen. I mean, I know a lot of people that claim to be atheists that morally, they have more, if you want to say morally or whatever, they have more morals or better, better, they're a better person than a lot of people that profess to be Christians. So, you know, it's just one of those things that it's, it's sad when you got someone that tells you, yes, I'm an atheist, but yet there's somebody that in, in reality you'd rather hang around with than somebody that professes to be your brother or sister in Christ because the way they're living it, I mean, they're certainly not going to be winning anybody to the Lord by the things they're doing, things they're saying or whatever, the, the, the way they vote, the way they do things. I mean, it's just, you know, they become, they become a curse rather than a blessing. You know, we need to get that turned around if we ever want to get a revival. You know, the, the Christians need to start getting their own selves right before we can get the rest of the world right. But God says he will save the people, which refers to not only will God preserve the nation of Israel, as we see today, and not only the nation to be destroyed, but the Savior of the world and the Lord Jesus Christ came through Israel, and God will save the, the whole nation spiritually at the end of the tribulation. You know, God says to not fear, but to keep their hands strong. You know, this was meant as encouragement for the people to trust in God that he would do as he promised, and to use this trust to finish building the temple. So again, you know, he's telling them, you know, let your hands be strong. You know, get out there, get to work. You know, don't have any fear because I'm here to protect you. I'm there to be your God. And so there's there's no reason to fear. You know, and it and again, you know, finishing up what I had said too about this other, you know, both Israel and, and the United States, you know, we, we want to pray all these times. Oh, Lord, bless us. You know, we always say like, you know, may God bless America. 
That's great. I, I hope he does. But, you know, it's like a lot of people say, may America bless God. That's really what comes down to America because God never going to get blessed by God until America starts blessing God. You know, that's what it takes. We have to get our lives right. So we start blessing God before he's going to get blessings to us because until then we're a curse. So, you know, and that, and that, you know, we see these things here with Israel. You know, a lot of ways we can just study Israel's history and we can see our own history. So, you know, we need to kind of learn from Israel so we don't keep making the same mistakes that they have, that they did. But we need to learn to trust trust God like, you know, um, Zechariah was telling Israel to do, or Judah. So look at Zechariah chapter 8, verse 14. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, as I thought to punish you when your fathers provoked me to wrath, saith the Lord of hosts, and I repented not. Now this verse says that as God thought to punish Judah, when their fathers provoked him to wrath or extreme anger, extreme anger, then he repented not. Now God did not repent, but did as he had promised, and he sent Judah into a 70-year captivity because of their idolatry, sin, and disobedience. You know, so God, you know, he said, you know, I thought to punish you when your fathers provoked me to wrath. And he repented not. He's saying that, you know, look, I told you that I was going to do this stuff. And you guys continue to live in your sin and disobedience. So why should I repent? So I'm going to do like, like I said I was going to do. I'm going to have you dispersed, you know, put into captivity and so forth. It, you know, God, God's not going to repent if we do not even repent. If we cannot repent, then why should he go and say, well, I'm not going to do this? Well, look at Zechariah chapter 8, verse 15. You know, and, and repent for God is not the same as it is like us. You know, it just means he's not going to sort of change his ways. He's not, you know, he's made up his mind. He's not going to change that. It's not like us that, you know, we're true repentance is, you know, we recognize that something is sin the same way that God sees something as sin. And we turn 180 degrees. So, you know, if, if we're going this way for sin, we need to turn 180 degrees backwards and go the other way and get away from it. You know, that we see that this is sin. You know, you're right, Lord, this is sin. I, I, I see that now. And then you, you you stop doing that. You know, you get away from it and so forth. So, but, you know, God, with God, it's not, it's, it's not repentance. You know, he doesn't have any sin, so he doesn't have to turn from sin. It's repentance in the sense that he's not going to change his mind, you know, because like even with us, when we change or turn 180 degrees, well, God's not going to turn from his, his wrath that he has said he was going to do you know, that's that repentance, you know, because they refuse to uh, repent themselves. Not they had, then he can, he can turn. You know, remember, he he wanted to destroy all the nation of Israel after after they built the golden calf. And he was going to make a new nation out of Moses, start with Moses. And Moses said, no, do not do that because, you know, you, you said you would, you know, you're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You made all these promises and so forth. And so, you know, God had repented of, of doing that. You know, he destroyed certain individuals, but, you know, he did not destroy the whole nation as a whole and start over again from Moses. You know, so that, that's the difference there when you see that word repent, you know, with God. It's not the same as like repentance of us. But look at verse 15. So Zechariah chapter 8, verse 15. So again, have I thought in these days to do well unto Jerusalem and to the house of Judah? Fear ye not. So God continues his thought in his verse by saying that just as he did not repent of punishing Judah, then he also would give them the blessing as he promised, so the people had no need to fear. No matter what may seem bad when God was still going to bless them, God wanted the people to trust him and believe him that he would do as he said, just as he did with the curse of, excuse me, verse 14. So you know, first of all, we see in this verse that once again, he's saying, you know, that the things he thought to do well under Jerusalem, you know, that he's going to do. So just as he promised to do the curses, he will also fulfill these these, promise, these blessings if they're being obedient. And so, um, you know, like I said, God gave him this promise after people finally started rebuilding the temple. And they had still been blessed since the return, but they were not getting the full blessing because of their disobedience and delaying rebuilding the temple. You know, so they had gotten some blessings 
from their return. But, you know, they weren't really getting the full benefit of these blessings because they were being disobedient and not rebuilding the temple and just kind of not really doing anything. And some of them had intermarried with some of the the uh, people of the land and had children with them. You know, read that in Ezra and Nehemiah. And, you know, then they end up having to get rid of them wives because they're, they're not <clears throat> supposed to be interbreeding with all these other other nations, <clears throat> you know, corrupting that seed. And so, but, you know, we see, though, that in this verse, just like in the curse, that, it, again, it talks about both um, well, I guess, sorry about this one. This one just talks about, about the house of Judah here. But, you know, we saw in the other one, it was about, you know, Israel and, and Judah. And so <clears throat> there in uh, verse 13, but, you know, you could trust God that just as he says he would do something with the curses, he's going to do the same thing with the blessings. Well, let's look at uh, verse 16. So Zechariah chapter 8, verse 16. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> These are the things that ye shall do. Speak ye every man the truth to his neighbor. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. So Zechariah tells them four things that God expects the people to do as a sign of their obedience and as a way to show their appreciation for God and the blessing. They were to speak the truth to their neighbor. That's number one. They were to tell the people about God. That's number two. You know, that should be Something that, um, you know, we, uh, well, I mean, that's part of the truth, rather, that, you know, when you're speaking the truth, you know, we need to tell people about God. I mean, that's, that's Christians as well. You know, we're so many people profess to be Christians, but they never, ever tell anybody about Jesus. They never even tell how people, those people don't even know they're saved or they don't, they don't do anything. They, they, they don't go to church. They don't. They don't pray, you know, they, they don't, there's just, there's nothing there. You know, they're, they're, you know, like I said, they cannot see the truth themselves because they're not even telling the truth. They're not telling people about that, hey, you should go on a path to hell, you know, unless you turn from your wicked ways and turn to Jesus. But they were to speak truth and keep peace among themselves and their neighbors <laughs> at the gates, you know, at their gates. You know, many court hearings were done at the gates. And God expected the truth to be told so that justice would be brought. You know, and this would bring peace. You know, if you have true justice, you know, if you have truth and justice, that's going to bring peace. But that's the problem. Even today, most of our courts are so corrupt and everything that, you know, but back, remember back in that day, like even different ones like in Ruth and so forth like that, they would always have these people at the gates. And, you know, like if say somebody, you know, like a Abimelech where they, you know, need to try to find out, you know, there was a closer relative that if he want, didn't want the land or whatever, then so he could marry Ruth, or Boaz rather. And um, so they went and they, uh, you know, they'd go to the gate and, they, you know, they'd have these off, you know, people there and they say, okay, I want you to be a witness that this is what's going to happen, this is that, or they'd go and, you know, certain things would, would go down, like you were, you had an issue with a neighbor or something, you know, you'd go to the people at the gate and, you know, they was like your, your justices or you know, the judges or whatever. And, and so a lot of these things would happen. But again, if you did not have truth, you know, you can never have true peace with peace without truth. You know, that's why we have no peace in this nation here. You know, people might think, we're, oh, we're not, not at a war. Oh, we're, first of all, we're at a spiritual war, very much so. But it's uh, you're not going to have that true peace because like the, the Democrats, you know, the, all the liberals, they're just the fake Republicans, all of them. They're just there's no truth in them. So you cannot have peace when when everything they say is a lie. You know they speak just like the, you know Satan's coming at them. That that uh, you know there's no truth. You know G Jesus said Satan was a liar from the beginning, and that's basically what they are. They just lie about everything. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. Well, we'll go ahead and finish this next verse, and then we'll stop. So look at because it goes with it. Look at Zechariah chapter eight verse seventeen. Let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor, and love no false oath, for all these are things that I hate, saith the Lord. So Zechariah continues the thought on the previous verse and lists two more things that God expected from the people. So we saw in the previous verse that God said to uh, every man speak the truth to his neighbor and execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. So those were the first two. 
Then here we have uh, the third thing was not to imagine evil in their hearts against their neighbor and not to love falsehoods. In other words, you know, don't be loving lies. Falsehoods, that's your lies. You know, they were not to make any false oaths or perjure themselves in court by lying against their neighbor. God said that he hated all four of those things. You know, God hates all sin and expects his people and, the, and his children that are saved to hate sin as well and to be obedient. You know, that goes back to that repentance I was talking about. You recognize that something is sin, what God calls sin, such as the LGBT movement, you know, and abortion. But the main sin that, that put the people into captivity had been idolatry, but it seems that now the sins of lying and doing injustice to people had become their new sins that they most likely picked up while in Babylon. They took on the ways of Babylon rather than the ways of God. You know, so we saw that, like I said, number one, they were to be uh, truth to their, his neighbor and execute the judgment of truth and peace in their gates. So those are the first two. Then they were to be, you know, no evil in their hearts against their neighbor and to have no false oath. You know, so like I said, so it, it, it seems that some of those things they were talking about the gates. And as I said, that's where the courts were. It seemed like a lot of them that were maybe going around and perjuring, you know, making up false things about their neighbors and so forth. And, you know, as I said, it was idolatry was the main sin that brought them into captivity there in Babylon. And from that point on, you know, after their 70 years, for the most part, certainly at least the real idolatry, which we think of idolatry like, you know, building a little idol and a statue and worshiping, bowing down to it. They never did have that again. Now, it's like anybody else. It's like here in America. And we have all kinds of idols, whether it's sports, money, job, you know, whatever it may be, some kind of possessions. But the, uh, you know, they didn't actually have like the physical idols. But the problem is they replaced some of that sin with probably things they picked up there in Babylon, such as this lying and the falsehoods and stuff. You know, so it seemed like those are the things that now became their main sins. And so God's telling them, you know, having Zechariah tell them, Look, you need to put all those things away. Let's, let's, you know, get right with the Lord and let's, let's move on. You know, God hates these things. So, you know, they needed to repent of these things and to turn to God. And, you know, if they really want to tr truly see these blessings to get them full blooming, then they need to turn the, away from the, these, these sins. You know, because God hates all sin for sure. But, you know, there are certain things he just flat out calls an abomination and, and it's just, you know, one of the things is he hates liars. You know, it says all liars are being held. Because lying affects so many things. As I said, even like with our politicians or whatever, that lying is, is so many things that when you go around, like people false accusing people, you know, people false accuse Christians all the time of this or that or, you know, whatever. And when, when you're doing these things, you again, you're never going to have that true peace because you're bringing all kinds of, of issues in here and you know god hates those things you know like i said i've had those things in myself where people lie and bring false oath against you and you know god, god hates that kind of stuff and, and and they will be punished one day by god but well uh let's have a word of prayer father we thank you for this time you've given us here to once again continue our study on zachariah we pray lord that you may bless each and every one that's here and us here online Continue to bless the rest of their day and the rest of their week. Allow for a safe return on Sunday. And we just pray, Lord, that uh, you just will turn this nation around and people will start turning from their lies and wicked evilness and just all the sins that we have, not only in this nation but around the world, that, that many might get saved before it's too late, and that uh, we know that your return is soon. We even pray, even so come, Lord Jesus. And so, Father, we do pray and want your return, but we also want to see many saved before that day, because we know that hell and the lake of fire are permanent and an awful place, and do not wish that upon anybody. And we need to have many saved while we still have, have the chance in this nation. And so I pray, Lord, that people will get the boldness and the courage to try to witness to, for, for you. And we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.